In the first of three readings on an education in the arts, I shared my reminiscences at times directly, at other times more tangentially, of my experiences as a student at the Slade School of Art. When reading from my essay Desiderata in William Coldstream Portraits of a Painter, a book which is due out this autumn, and in the question period after, it became clear to me that there were certain parts of the story that I couldn't include in print. Uh, they were just too private, too personal. The case of my brilliant pupil, Stephen Foster, whom we still remember fondly, uh, is one such instance. In the third of my dialogues in An Education in the Arts, at a date still to be confirmed, probably in the late autumn of 2021, I hope to explore in a little more depth the challenges I've stepped up to in my time in art education, which is going back some 40 years now. The value I place on mentoring experience, the influences that have prevailed then and now, and some of the students I've taught. My reading today is taken from an essay written in the autumn 2020, so in uh, in lockdown, uh, and is included in an anthology in celebration of the life achievements of artist, curator, educator, and historian of modern art, Dr. John Golding, CBE. Uh, this will appear in John Golding Remembered or Has, in fact, just appeared this month in uh, a book entitled John Golding Remembered, with contributions by his students, among them Don Addis, Elizabeth Cowling, Professor of Art History at the University of Edinburgh. Don Addis, you'll all remember as the curator of the great Dada and Cyrilla show at the Hayward some years ago. Christopher Green and John Richardson, Picasso's biographer. So it's a, it's a fascinating assembly of, uh, of reminiscences on, on John. Inevitably, my remarks today will reflect my own experience, training, capacitation, and above all, a deep respect uh, and affection uh, for my former teacher. I want to begin with a very brief uh, biographical note, uh, simply to help us ease, to ease us into the subject, for those of you who may not be familiar with this um, figure. John Golding, who died in 2012 at the age of 82, lived separate but intertwined working lives as an artist, author, curator, educator, and historian of modern art. His doctoral dissertation published in 1959 as Cubism, a History and an Analysis, focusing on the years 1907 to 1914, was for several decades the standard university text on Cubism, that most seminal of 20th century aesthetic movements. Golding's place in a scholarly appreciation of Picasso's oeuvre is ranked alongside Pierre Dex's Dictionnaire Picasso. And equally alongside the work of the surrealist painter and critic Sir Roland Penrose, the collector Douglas Cooper, and John Richardson, whom I've just mentioned, as the author of the definitive four volume biography of Picasso. But more even than his writing, Two groundbreaking exhibitions, Picasso, Sculptor Painter in 1994, and Matisse Picasso in 2002 3, both at Tate, established Golding's credentials as an exceptional Picasso scholar. He was passionately committed to abstraction, and his conviction that abstraction con conveyed profound truths is set out in his book Paths to the Absolute, published in 2000 a collection of essays on European and American abstract artists that include Piet Mondrian, Kasimir Malievich, Vasily Kandinsky, Jackson Pollock, and Mark Rothko, among others. Born in Hastings in East Sussex, Golding spent his early childhood and youth in Mexico. There, under the wing of the maverick English painter Leonora Carrington, Golding met the Surrealists exiled from France during World War II and other celebrities such as the filmmaker Luis Buñuel and the poet Octavio Paz. The Mexican muralists, as you will see, 
Jose Clemente Orozco in particular, were important influences to Golding in his early years. He taught at the Courtauld, and he taught me at the Courtauld, but not as early as 1959 when his teaching began, and at the Royal College of Art from 1981. By then, he was intent on becoming a full-time professional artist, committed to driving forward his exploration of color and light. He had a run of shows in top flight art galleries in London and at the Museum of Modern Art Oxford, in Tokyo, Sydney, and the Yale Center for British Art in New Haven. His lifetime partner, the British historian of anarchism and socialism, James Toole, died in 1994. The death, the death of his mother and sister in ensuing years left Golding increasingly isolated and alone a painful chapter also for those who knew and loved him. What follows then now, as it were, are a series of personal reflections on an admired artist, teacher, mentor, and friend. And I've called this 24 Ash Church Park Villas, Theater of Light, in a reference to his address in West London. Light and truth have always been associated in my mind, although I can also recognize a truth of darkness. A photograph taken in 1953 draws us into an intimacy with its human subject, deep in thought. The small clay fragment of a head with elaborate headdress, the focus of his attention and no less alive, once formed part of a larger ceremonial figurine from the Veracruz region in the Gulf of Mexico. With one hand, he holds the clay vestige of an earlier civilization, bearing its weight and delicate fabric, while with the other, he follows the braille-like contours, crags, and fault lines that run from the figure's upper lip to its left ear. In this encounter, Arts objects restore a link between past and present, new and old worlds, an indigenous Mayan civilization in the first millennium CE and Western culture at the close of the second. Close scrutiny reveals the signs of continuity and rupture, material or stylistic innovation and cultural hybridity as the shaping constructs of subjectivity. Markings seen just above the figure's left eye, made from a blend of tar and rubber known as chapapote, were believed to enhance the figure's lifelike qualities, its magical powers, its numen. Taken within months of the artist and our John Golding's visit to the great Cubism exhibition in Paris in that year, 1953, the photograph is framed by a keen awareness of the transforming gaze of indigenous cultures, African, Oceanian, Mesoamerican, on Western artists of the 20th century. Within months of this visit, and having two years earlier opted to leave for Europe, Golding retraced his steps, interrupting his studies at the Courtauld Institute to return to the seclusion and safety of the family lair. By then, he had embarked on the subject of his doctoral thesis that published as Cubism, a history and an analysis, would for the next 30 years become the standard reference. His brief return rekindled an attachment to the country's rich visual and literary traditions and its intellectual voices, among them the novelist Carlos Fuentes and the poet Octavio Paz. Their writings revel in the knotted imaginary of Mexico's indigenous past, its brutal colonial history and vibrant present. Post-revolutionary Mexico would emerge from an all too confining reliance on European cultural forms to a celebration of a twofold indigenismo or nativism and modernism. Golding's visit also served to uncover urgent subjects. For the next 50 years, these were developed alongside his pursuits as a writer, art historian, and educator with an unassailable reputation. 
One such subject was the stripped torso of a young man, his flesh bared to an assault of sharp, stabbing strokes made with a loaded brush, bringing to mind perhaps the Mayan civilization's sacrificial rites. A darkened mood and turbulent clouds of cobalt blue engulf the abject body. Golding spoke repeatedly of his admiration for the work of the Mexican muralist Jose Clemente Orozco, describing him as, quote, my greatest source of inspiration. Though a more complex layer of illusion is also discernible here, post-war existentialism and informalism. Surrounding the cupola above Orozco's great mural cycle for the Hospicio in Guadalajara's Instituto Cultural Cabañas, the portentous man of fire, a frieze of simplified emblems painted in grisai technique, includes two bulky headless torsos. One of these, seen at the lower left corner of your screen, Since antiquity, the male torso indicated antonymic conditions of the human, injury and inviolability, beauty and terror, muscular strength and homoeroticism. These concerns are expressed in the deep twisting elongation of the back, arms and legs of a small naked torso modeled in clay, later cast in metal, confirming the subject's centrality for Golding. He returned to the subject in Desnudo Gris, Torso, 1959, where once again we sense Orozco's presence. The emaciated figures in El Pueblo y sus falsos líderes, the people and their false leaders, 1935 to 7, stripped to the waist, vie with their oppressive leaders and wealthy employers, ringed by encroaching flames that spell perpetual damnation. Golding remarked on Orozco's figures that they seem, quote, in some way flayed. They wear their skeletons on the outside like armor, unquote. This new logris hung above bronze pillow in the sparsely furnished, almost monastic bedroom, a sure mark of its iconic status in his oeuvre. Wounds and lacerations are built up from stiff white paint into shallow relief. These raised pentimenti, more pronounced in areas of the ribcage, aptly suggest bone matter. These very same striations occur repeatedly and with increasing emphasis in Golding's later abstract works, as in this large canvas, H12 Danae, 1982, as tacit indices of the body, which are, quote, always there in my work, that is what my paintings are about." Unquote. This is also true of the hard edge abstractions of the mid 1960s, such as Achilles 1965-66, or here in Portman Square, and in the freer lyrical abstractions of the mid 1980s, to which I will return later. Taken in the year that saw the publication of novelist and travel writer, Rose Macaulay's Pleasure of Ruins. The photograph signals Golding's absorption in the life of objects as embodied knowledge. Quote, I've always done my thinking through looking, he remarked. Adding that works of art have the ability to absorb and hold me instantly. He described his own response to art as primarily instinctive and manifested his disquiet with a recent theorizing turn in art history. In its ephemerality, as much as ghostly or ruinated state, the small head from Veracruz, like several other archaeological pieces in his collection, offered a necessary distance for contemplation, a distance equated with loss, extinction of a once thriving civilization. It's, quote, pleasure derived perhaps from an under-theorized, imaginative restoration of an elusive wholeness. A mnemonic, the small head remained with him until the end of his life, reviving the memory of itinerant journeys 
and a profound attachment to Mexican culture. And this is what I think brought John and I together. My visits to the West London home of John Golding and his lifelong partner, the author and social historian James Joel, were always preceded by a good deal of nervous anticipation. A glass canopy, deceptively long, linked the gated entrance at street level to their front door, like the covered Galleria de Bor of Borromini's Palazzo Spada, growing longer by the step. Yet the shuffle of approaching feet on the terracotta floor and the welcoming smile revealed through the gate's ornately patterned ironwork offered reassurance, reviving those qualities of friendship and affection I so valued. Golding, pictured right in this remarkable double portrait by the American painter resident in London of the time, R.B. Kitai, was careful in his appearance and dress though seldom showy or theatrical. Years of teaching fashioned his masculine demeanor and upright gaze, gait, one hand always tucked snugly into his waist, on which he seemed to want to rest the full weight of an arm, and perhaps more. His voice, gentle if distinctive, projected authoritatively. Typically, he was seen in loose, colorful, Kosovorotka, if the pronunciation is correct, those are these long blouse-like um, garments, the one he's wearing in blue, of the kind worn by Russian men of a certain generation, often with a, a knotted silk kerchief of printed madras tied around his neck. This is not the conventional attire, of course, of worn by men in London in the 1700s and 80s, but it somehow impressed us all and set him aside. Now the house itself, which I'll be spending some time talking about and thinking about, was a mise-en-scene for an array of objects that invariably caught one's eye. It was a place of learning as much as a space for feelings safely explored in Spanish, a language we shared. During one such visit, Gilding expressed rapture at the sight of two turtle doves balanced on a branch, cooing, preening, their necks lovingly entwined. At another, he appeared with a large envelope, a gift containing a review copy of Picasso's Gongora, loosely bound and fresh off the press, with a copy of the review itself, which later appeared in the New York Review of Books for which Golding was a regular feature writer. To the philosopher Gaston Bachelard, the house is a vertical being. It rises upward from cellar to attic. But possessing neither, the rooms in this joint household extended outward along a horizontal axis. Doors and windows opened, opened out onto generous light wells, a courtyard and gardens tangled clematis, magnolia, and winter flowering camellia pierce the home's muted skin with sudden bursts of color. John was partial to these changing patterns of light, their refractory effects more pronounced in the studio, where light came streaming in from openings in the ceiling above. He made dazzling use of their nuanced effects in paintings and drawings the latter with saturated pastels on transparent washes of color. For him, light and color were totally interdependent and indivisible. In his vibrant double portrait from London, the painter draftsman Arbi Kitai observed this play of light, its ethereal reflections and color transparencies recorded with a near oriental delicacy of brushwork. This detail, incidental though it seems within the larger composition, does bear mention. The billowing patterns produced on a sheer wall by a pair of net curtains opposite prefigure Golding's shift away from the severe framing uprights and horizontals 
that break up the expansive fields of lemon, chrome yellow, oriolin, and orpiment in works titled rather recondictly as EUB 6, 1976, or FWY 3, 1977, for freer bursts of color associated with works such as Quarried Light, or here K4 Mappa Mundi of 1992. Inevitably, the house and its objects reflected the personalities and identities of both its occupants. Ungainly armchairs covered in chintzes intimated a languid English comfort, as much the legacy of Golding's childhood home in Mexico City. English to the core, his family were among the earliest migrants from England to settle there in the early 19th century, as of Joel's preference for casualness. By contrast, the studied choreography of objects and white walls, sparsely punctuated with works of art, suggested a new world idealism. No one feature of the house manifested this more keenly than the two-sided cabinet of curiosities formed out of a door arch linking vestibule and sitting rooms and glazed only on one side to form a kind of treasury. And you see that on the sort of left side, left center of your screen. The objects reveal themselves to the visitor on entering the sanctuary proper exerting a powerful influence. They offered more than an elaborate and cultural and cultured backdrop for human action. Actors in their own right, they shaped the lives of those within, constructing value, meaning, relationship. New and old world antiquities are conjoined at the summit. And here I want to issue a disclaimer. I don't, of course, have close-up photographs of all of the individual objects. And so I'm going to project or show um, objects that come as close to them as possible. Um, so you'll see that there's a slight mismatch between my descriptions and the objects in front of you, but I don't think it amounts to much. So please bear with me. Have a good look anyway at what's there. I don't know that we're coming back to this particular slide. Naked from the waist up, the seated figure from Jalisco, Mexico, Olmec culture, exudes a quiet authority. Next to this, a contemporary, likewise anonymous, Corinthian Ope jar, 600 BCE, ringed with ornate animals inscribed in clay, its delicate, urbane forms echoing those of the fragile silhouette of a stoneware bottle with pitted moon-like surfaces on the shelf below, the work of the Viennese-born ceramist, Lucy Rhee. She trains our eye up the spiral motif, a device achieved by combining porcelain clays with stoneware in slow ascent, like an umbilical cord, twisting around its swollen forms, past its craned neck to the flared lip above. Asserting its modernist credentials on the shelf below, Antony Caro's elegant table piece offers a precarious, if playful, balance of opposing physical forces. It conveys an immediacy and speed of execution akin to drawing. Our eyes proceed to the lower echelons, coming to rest on the wooden ceremonial stool or pierced saddle made by the Ghanaian Asante tribe. This owes its curved shape to the earliest prototypes for the divine throne of kings known as, and my Ghanaian is a little bit lacking here, Sika Dwal Kofi, which means golden stool born on a Friday. What a wonderful title, with its proven incantatory powers, magical powers. Arranged with deference to their size, weight, roundness, or angularity, these studied juxtapositions offer a distilled primer of forms, spurning traditional hierarchies between artist and artisan, high and low. A clamoring of voices, Greek, Olmec, Ghanaian, added to the Italian, French, and Spanish heard at home, invokes their makers, the carvers, welders, modelers, potters, painters, conjuring an air of celebration 
like friends, quote, seldom found in a room together, unquote. It's a remark made by Kitai in his essay, Human Clay. That is celebrating in each other's company, rather like we're doing today. To the left of the arch, and no less part of this ensemble, are two works by the celebrated Mexican painter, screenwriter and set designer Gunter Gerso, Golding's friend and correspondent of 40 years. Those exchanges, often rich in psychological insight, offered a needed outlet for guarded feelings and moments of doubt, encouragement when spirits were low, and relief from solitude or intellectual isolation. Candid at times, blunt, Gerso's words were never intentionally hurtful. Let me give you an example. The combination painter-art-historian is a particularly tough one. In the long run, you'll have to choose. One or the other will suffer, he cautioned. And then, don't try to be St. Francis and the Pope at the same time. They have little in common, even though they both work for the same church. Invoking works from Greek and Mayan antiquity, Gunther Gerso's Gulf of Corinth, which you see on the screen, 1959, and a companion work, Saipay, 1961, we'll look at that in a moment, suggest eternity and infinity. The rich materiality of Gulf of Corinth, with its dark tidal waters and thunderclouds overhead, brings to mind the disturbing force of Courbet's seascapes at Etretat, the waters there forever sculpting the chalk cliff face. An eternal pall descends on Saipé, shutting out all but a mere trace of light from a falling meteor. Half the painted surface forms a dense, almost perfect black square. Its shape and cosmic scale resonate with John Walker's vast canvas on the wall opposite, entitled Tense 2, 1966-67. Walker's audacious use of space, rugged assembly of pictorial elements, and experimental methods set him apart from the contemporary trend on both sides of the Atlantic, post painter the abstraction, championed by the censorious art critic Clement Greenberg. A solid black square hovers over and dominates the right half of the composition, a dense mass over an indeterminate space, this softer effect achieved by repeated soaking and staining of the raw cotton canvas. A photograph of Golding taken by Heine Schneebly in the Battersea apartment he and Joel occupied before moving to Hammersmith in the same year reveals the distinctive silhouette of Walker's black square in the background. In profile, he peers attentively into the light streaming into the room. When Walker's painting was eventually rehung at Ashchurch Park Villas, Golding placed a small linocot print by the Russian suprematist Kasimir Malievich, which you see on the screen. Walker recalls how together they went to visit the print's owner, the London dealer Wolfgang Fischer. John agonized for hours of this purchase, Walker reminisced. When I speak of Golding as a collector, is unlike other notable collectors. The fictional Jean de Cessant, the creation of the symbolist author J.K. Hoosman's novel, A Rebours Against the Grain, published in 1884, or his true flesh and blood counterparts, Gertrude and Leo Stein, some years later, or the Cohn sisters in Baltimore, or far closer to Golding, the Cuba scholar and collector Douglas Cooper, and fellow artist and writer Roland Penrose. But Golding seldom had the means to acquire trophies and estates, as Madame Matisse and Picasso's heirs clearly did. He never dealt in or profited from works of art as the art dealer Daniel Henry Kahnweiler would have, nor did he accept positions in the public eye, for instance, at the helm of a great collecting institution, as Alfred Barr would at MoMA in New York. And yet, as a trustee and council member of the Museum of Modern Art and of the Tate in London, he was certainly in a position to influence opinion. And he knew almost all of those I've mentioned. Golding was frugal 
never profligate or covetous. He had little of that acquisitive sense that collectors must have. His collection was formed largely of gifts, tokens of appreciation, of friendship bestowed on others, tributes from fellow artists to acknowledge John's infallible eye. The date, October 1972, and I've just arrived in London. With fellow students at the Slade School of Art, we assemble in a busy, smoke-filled room to hear John Golding deliver his epochal lecture on that most radical, irreducible, and uncompromisingly abstract of 20th century icons, Malievich's Black Square. As we listen to his hushed, at times hesitant voice, the excitement in the room is palpable. A handwritten note from the sometime notorious American art critic Barbara Rice, discovered some 50 years later by me in a drawer somewhere, later celebrated the lecture's searching implications and understructures, far grander than the also important and present scholarly detail. That, together, reignited her, quote, excitement and respect for the potential of art history and the courtal, unquote. These are most unusual lines for someone like Barbara Rice, who's used to creating controversy. So she was clearly very impressed. Scribbled in the margins of my own notebook of the period, I find the following verbatim description of Malievich's character it comes straight out of John's mouth. Quote, impetuous, still crude, full of life and power, clearly given to extremes, unquote. In the space of that hour, Golding showed how the intellectual rigor of the scholar, writer, and thinker was not inimical to the visual articulacy of the artist, far from it. Instead, one informed and reinforced the other. Having recently arrived in London, only to find that I could not consistently rely on the guidance around me, teaching at the Slade being then at an impasse, Golding's lecture, indeed, indeed his entire approach, offered a clear pointers and ignited my desire to learn once again. What stood out for me on that occasion was his ability to intensify the visual experience, citing cinema, cinematographic effects to show the sequence of steps by which Malievich arrived at this most uncompromising of images. That very long word I couldn't pronounce means really film-like. Cinematographic, I think, is the word. Drawn to his insights and erudition, I approached John afterwards. Notice that I've moved from Golding to John, but I think I'll revert to Golding in a moment, since this is really about him. This was the start of a 30-year relationship, admiring and deferential on my part, becoming increasingly friendly and informal on his, it's somehow always rewarding. Back in Golding's domestic environment, moving past the arch and its treasures toward the far corner of the room, looking west through a pair of glazed doors into the conservatory and the garden beyond, were two oil paintings by the artist and art critic Adrian Stokes, both penumbral and key. He and Golding were part of a remarkable generation of painter critics that included Lawrence Gowing and Andrew Forge, all reveling in the essential complementarity of word and image. Golding confided, I see almost everything I paint now as being an homage to Cezanne. His landscape feeds my painting. In turn, Stokes remarked on the complex, vivid organization of things as they present themselves to Cezanne. His respect for nature was profound, his achievement classical, weighty, yet full of fire. Those are Stokes's words. They shared an interest in the tradition of still life, a young admirer wrote of Stokes's ability to distill rare beauty from civilian things found in the ordinary run of life. Objects that are typ typically within bodily reach, but already in the realm of independent being. Bottles and jugs are disclosed as luminous presence. Returning to a subject that had earlier consumed Golding, a forensic study of Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso, at their most hermetic, during the analytical period of Cubism, he described Braque's grand late ateliers 
as among the most powerful, profound, and challenging of all 20th century works. His essay, An Object Lesson in Itself, reveals the qualities of light and space that Golding aspired to in his own works. Braque's objects, their spatial relationships, were, quote, totally convincing from a naturalistic point of view, and yet simultaneously strangely shifting and evanescent, almost dreamlike, while they flow into the space that surrounds them, space in turn flows back into them. Just as his cubist paintings, they reflect or even embody a single continuum of the material and the non-material. Among his earliest memories, Golding recalled with excitement how on approaching his 80th birthday, he received a small red box containing six tubes of oil color and three brushes. Eagerly, he set to work making a copy of a luminous magazine illustration of a landscape, all yellow fields and a green tree. In the course of the 40 years journey that followed, Golding would relinquish the dark strains and tragic content of the early Mexican painting to embrace a restrained, expansive color surfaces of his abstract geometric works of the mid 1960s, becoming ever freer and more atmospheric in the years that followed. Yet his concern with light and its absence remained constant. He could well have found in Cezanne's Les Tangs des Soeurs on display at the Courtauld Galleries in Woven Square at the time, an echo of that combination of yellows and greens that once caught his eye, dense layers of paint applied diagonally in broad swathes with a palette knife or trowel produced luminous vibrations. On reading Cubism, a history and analysis again after many years, I realized just how fully Golding had absorbed Cezanne's art. Just visible through the glass-covered archway where Walker's Tension II once hung, containing resonances of both landscape and the body, freely painted in translucent lemons and greens against a neutral limestone ground, is Golding's K2 Pleated Light, 1992. Flashes of lightning and bone-like striations inscribe the surface repeatedly recalling the contral layers of fissile rock on which artists of the Orination, the Cro-Magnon, Europe's earliest inhabitants, captured the stampeding movements of wild herds at Lascaux, for instance. And as with many of Golding's works, we find those qualities aptly described by his friend, the philosopher Richard Volheim, as, quote, a strong underlying unity and a great deal of surface change. Should we perceive in its tentative handling the large areas of bare canvas suggesting of non finito, the unfinished, and others densely layered, echoes of the landscape of his youth, the earthquake-prone valley of Mexico, surrounded by high mountains, volcanoes, lakes, and canals, where once Teotihuacan, Toltec, and Aztec civilizations thrived, thrived, the fragile remains lodged within the geological strata of its now extinct basin. Now, I have uh, overrun my time. I wonder whether at this point to just uh, close this uh, reading uh, or whether uh, you would like to uh, perhaps spend the next two minutes just hearing the conclusion to the essay. Alex, what's your feeling? Continue reading for a little while or? Yeah, continue so we hear the end. It's only just a short passage really. There are objects we own, albeit only for a brief moment in time, and those we can never own, yet that possess us fully. In his closing years, and increasingly after Joel's death, when the emotional structures, daily rhythms, and routines Golding once relied on proved less dependable, the presence of those objects, chaste vessels of memory, offered reassurance and jouissance, as if in the presence of old friends, Curiously, for one who lived so fully in his objects and kept company with their makers, his own paintings are devoid of objects, though apposite qualities of stillness suffuse the early abstract canvases. Two memories in closing. The first, a visit to the National Gallery, Golding pulling excitedly at my arm. The quiet spectacle afforded by Giovanni Bellini's image of serenity and patience, Madonna del Prato, 
epitomized those qualities of pure sensation and rich visuality Golding so admired. Observing that for Bellini and for Venetian painters after him, Titian and Edonese, light and color would become more or less synonymous, he confided. If I had to name the single most beautiful thing in the world, it would be late Bellini without question. The world and all of nature are apprehended with the precision of an enlarging lens. The landscape itself, a container of symbols, parables, allusions, and citations. The truth conveyed by this radiant image awash with light is of a new visuality, a resplendence, drawing away the darkness and superstition of an earlier age. Conscious nonetheless of its darker unfolding, a prefiguration of Pietà and ultimate sacrifice, the painting speaks to us of a longing for union, for the infant as for the exile, flight from the family lair is experienced as a severance or loss of wholeness, seldom regained. A second memory, and I mentioned there are two, they were closing. Lunch around the refractory table, of bleached appearance made from planks of scrubbed ash. We sit on hard, spindle-backed chairs softened by cushions, the one with arms reserved for our host. A keen vegetarian, Golding serves a sizzling potato gratin with sliced hard-boiled eggs steeped in a rich bechamel sauce, all creamy yellows, a dash of nutmeg to finish. And hey, fresh greens arrive in one of Anne Stokes' simple hand-decorated bowls. Presiding over the din of knives and forks, Piet Mondrian's Composition with yellow, blue, black, red, and gray, 1921, exudes a perfect stillness on a wall awash with light. He is, to me, the most moving of all 20th century artists, John explained. And then the element of sacrifice and abnegation and the fact that he was prepared to sacrifice so much of life just to put it back into his work. This is how Golding explains why Mondrian is uppermost in his thoughts. In this theater of light, with its reverence for the companionship of objects, one has the sense of a life of dedication, if not sacrifice. Thank you. I'm delighted to welcome our guest speakers this afternoon, Alexandra Bloom and Rachel Gadsden. My association with them goes back many years. Both artists have participated in our workshops in a variety of settings and now contribute to Learning Pathways programs and I hope to its future viability. Both have made remarkable strides in the period I've known them toward their professionalization of their practices and development of an artistic language. Each artist will give a 15 minute presentation touching on broader aspects of their practice, training, capacitation and experience, touching on their personal and professional motivations, as well as their careers. I'll introduce one at a time and we will then be able to address questions at the end of both presentations. Drawing has been central to Alexandra Bloom's practice for many years. A long apprenticeship focusing on the ways we encounter space in the urban environment. The fragmented spatial and temporal structures in her work are informed by an interest in early Netherlandish painting, and she will refer to this in the course of her presentation. She highlights a research scholarship at Kyoto University I beg your pardon, Kyoto City University of Arts in Japan in 1996 to 98, and her role as artist in residence at Dalston Square construction site in 2008 to 2010, as providing much needed encouragement at key moments in her career. Alexander was recently awarded the prestigious Hugh Casson Prize for drawing at the 2019 RA Summer Exhibition as well as an Oppenheim John Downs Memorial Award in 2012 
and the David Gluck Memorial Bursary for Drawing in 2008. She is also currently serving as an artist educator at the Courtauld Institute of Art. And so I'm delighted to welcome Alex to, to the meeting. Alex, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, so it's really great uh, to be here. Um, so I'm going to share my screen straight away so that you can um, see what I'm talking about right from the outset. Um, so I'm going to show um, work from three um, drawing projects that I've made over the past 15 years. Um, and I'm going to talk about them in relation to drawing space and time in relation to some key aspects of my own education and also talk a little bit about um, the teaching that I do. So it's uh, 2010 and I'm um, 150 feet up in the air on a small scaffold platform and it feels really exhilarating to have access to somewhere that was previously just pure empty space. Um, and it's a wonderfully clear day and I can see all the way from the buildings in the distance all the way down to the activity on the building site um, directly um, underneath me. Um, and that sensation of being on a tiny island surrounded by this huge arc of space is the sensation that I use as the starting point uh, for this drawing. And the reason that I was up there was because at the time I was spending 18 months as artist in residence at the Dalston Square construction site um, in Hackney in East London. And that was part of a, a wider project where I spent three years um, drawing the whole, uh, making around 200 uh, drawings of the area as it was torn apart um, and rebuilt. So at the time I lived and had a studio in Dalston, so it was an area that was really familiar to me. And then one day these five huge uh, cranes turned up at Dawson Junction and they were amazing forms in their own right, but also felt like symbols of the huge amounts of change that were about to come to the area. And I kept walking past the cranes and admiring them, but I didn't start drawing them straight away. And one of the things that actually got me drawing the cranes was um, uh, a studio visit from Glenn. Um, and he was looking through some uh, sketchbooks in which I had drawings that I'd made in other locations. And he commented that those, the drawings in the sketchbooks felt as if they'd come through me um, in contrast to um, other work in the studio, which felt more schematic. And that really chimed with um, something that I was feeling at the time that the work I was making in the studio was feeling further and further away um, from the things that I was, was really interested in and thinking about on a daily basis as I walked through the city. So Glenn's um, comment was one of the things that gave me the confidence to go back out um, and start um, drawing, oops, start drawing um, the cranes. And it felt hugely liberating to realize that drawing could be the medium for the entire body of work. Um, and to realize that drawing gave me the means to be out on the street witnessing and recording um, all these changes to my local area. So I was drawing the relationship between the older buildings and new constructions. And then, as I say, I became artist in residence inside the Dalston Square construction site, which was fantastic because suddenly it felt as if I had my own mountainside to climb in Hackney. So I was um, climbing the scaffolding um, making, um, making drawings as I went along of all these spaces undergoing rapid um, transition and then finally drawing inside one of the completed flats. So the first drawings that I made were quite fast linear drawings using an almost continuous line to describe the outline of entire forms. But when I realised just how much of the area was going to change, so this was a row of shops and houses on Kingsland High Street, all of which were demolished. So when I realised how much of the area was going to change, I really wanted to slow the drawings down and make the whole observation process much more specific. So what we're looking at here on the left is this section just here. So the, um, the Kingsland High, High Street drawing, instead of being made up of these um, continuous lines describing the outline of entire forms um, that I was using in the crane drawings, the Kingsland High Street drawing is made up of lots of small marks. So instead of drawing all of one form uh, and all of the next, 
I'd make an observation, maybe the corner of a window, make a mark in relation to that observation. And then instead of continuing to draw that form, I'd then make an observation of a neighboring form. So maybe the window next to it um, and make a mark then in relation to the observation that I've just made, but also in relation to um, the previous mark I've made. So that in that way, the relationship between forms and the relationship between a form and the surrounding space become completely interwoven. So one quite literally couldn't exist without the other. So the space in the drawing um, emerges out of um, the series of observations that I was making whilst I was in the space um, so that um, the drawing then becomes like an imprint um, of the space. And that shift um, between, uh, or the, rather the shift towards a much more direct relationship between that moment of observation and making the mark was a really fundamental uh, change in the way that I was drawing. And it meant that I could look much more closely. Um, and it was also a shift away from drawing individual forms and towards drawing relationships. So it suddenly felt as if I had the means to draw the very specific spatial interactions um, that I was seeing all around me. And that felt really exciting. So in subsequent drawings, um, I was combining that slow, close looking process with faster ways of drawing as, as an intuitive response to the varied paces of um, change and movement that I was seeing around me. And again, Glenn made another insightful comment when he first saw this drawing, um, when he commented on, on or pointed out how the drawing contains those different drawing languages, contains those different speeds. And that was so useful because it made me consciously aware of the impact of having those two different ways of drawing um, in the same image. And I think the role of a, of a mentor as someone who can um, make astute comments about a particular aspect of a mentee's work in order to make them fully conscious of it so that they can then exploit it to its full potential is something that I value um, really highly. Um, and I've also uh, benefited hugely from insights into spatial constructions from conversations with and um, drawing trips with, with the artist Timothy Hyman. So, so that's an, another aspect that's been really um, important to me. And using um, uh, different drawing, a variety of drawing speeds to convey movement um, and therefore um, uh, convey the passage of time is something that's also key to drawings I've been making since 2017 um, at Angerstein Wharf near North Greenwich um, on the banks of the Thames. So on this drawing, I really wanted to draw the world in um, progress. Um, and I was really fascinated by um, the, all these seagulls that were wheeling around as, as aggregate was being unloaded um, from the conveyor belt. And the way that um, as the tide uh, rose, all these bits of um, jetsam um, and various water birds also um, arrived with it. And all of this activity was, was um, constantly um, circling around um, this slowly chuntering um, conveyor belt. And between 2017 until the um, start of the pandemic, I was walking past Angerstein Wharf on a regular basis to get to my studio. So I would regularly see um, these um, ships um, that were bringing aggregate to be unloaded. And of course, the ships arrive and depart um, with the tides. So in this drawing, I wanted to draw both the ship's presence and its absence. And I wanted to draw the way that um, my observation of, of a ship in a current moment in time also held my memory of its absence in the past and my expectation of its return in the future. And I think this was also a way of trying to find a way of drawing that the ceaseless um, ebb and flow of the tides um, and the way that tidal forces make cyclical rhythms so strongly felt in this particular area. And um, 
that's um, that idea um, of a current moment in time holding the past and future within it is something is an idea that I encountered um, when I was in Japan. So I spent um, 18 months at Kyoto City University of Arts between 1996 and 1998 with a MEXT research scholarship. Um, so this, uh, this image we're looking at now is called Rough Waves um, and it was made by Ogata Korin um, between 1704 and 1709, which is in Japan's Edo period. Um, and that idea of a current moment in time holding both the past and future within it, um, it I think is conveyed by the structure um, of this image. So for example, at, at first glance, we're aware of this strongly circular motion um, in the image. And then we realize these central forms are creating a, a semicircle, which on the left in particular is rising up um, towards the, um, uh, the wave above, creating a counter rhythm. And then we see um, that the wave at the bottom is also transforming before our eyes into a wave that's moving in the opposite direction and about to break over our feet. And I think it's that paradox of a circular unity that's actually made up of these contrasting rhythms, um, which, which conveys an experience of time which isn't a single frozen moment in time, nor is it a, a, a series of consecutive moments, but for me at least, it conveys an experience of time of being absorbed in a present moment whilst still retaining awareness of the past and, and the future. So the point I really wanted to make is that I love the way that observing um, forms that are in motion um, and in flux um, can lead to finding ways of visualizing a, a felt subjective experience of time. Um, and the way that the structure of an image can convey um, an experience of time is also something I find really fascinating in early Netherlandish painting. So this is um, the entombment known as the Xylan Triptych, um, which is attributed to Robert Compan and was made around 1425. So it's in, um, it's part of the Courtauld's collection um, and one of my favorite paintings uh, in their collection. So it's one that I often use um, for the drawing workshops that I teach for the Courtauld's uh, Young People's Programme. And it's a really fantastic painting to explore through um, drawing. Um, and as students do that, they become really, um, oh, sorry. Um, as students, as students start to explore the painting through drawing, they become really involved in um, uh, discovering the, um, the, the precision of the placement of forms in this painting. So for example, they discover um, things like this, this tiny space underneath a wrist or the way that the folds of this cloth almost meet or this tiny ear peeping out from underneath a turban or the way that Christ's hand, uh, sorry, um, Mary Magdalene's hand is, is reaching gently up to Christ's foot or, or another hand is brushing away a tear. And those gradual discoveries really pull students um, into the space. Um, and that also helps them to discover the multiple viewpoints um, in the painting. So for example, the way that there's um, this gap in the foreground um, between these two kneeling figures, and that gap invites us to imagine ourselves kneeling in that gap. And as, as we do so, from that position, we feel as if we're looking up at the body of Christ. But it's equally um, easy for us to imagine ourselves hovering in space um, above all the figures at the same height as these blue and red angel. And from that position, we feel as if we're looking down onto the body of Christ. And I love the way that the multiple viewpoints and um, and the precise placement of all these um, closely observed details, both of those things combine to encourage our eye to start roaming around the space so that we piece together our understanding of the space gradually as we move through it, which in turn builds a feeling of duration 
into the image. Um, and that idea within early Netherlandish painting of a space where the viewer's eye isn't just directed to a, a central point of focus, but is encouraged um, to go on a slow contemplative journey around the image um, has become central to a series of drawings that I've been making um, at home during lockdown. So for example, in this drawing, um, where I wanted to draw the flow of space um, and the interaction between interior and exterior, as well as a series of small quiet observations um, that, I've, that, that I've made um, within the home. So for example, um, noticing the sun suddenly um, glinting on the window or, or this small sliver of space between the uh, bottom of the window and the windowsill or the blind chains moving in the wind or or shadows appearing underneath wires or, or, or noticing remnants of um, wrapping paper, for example. Um, and I hope that um, all, of the, all of these small observations within the drawing encourage um, the viewer to be able to choose their own route um, through the painting, uh, through the drawing, sorry. Um, and hopefully gradually discovering a record of how I've been living in that space as they do so. Two minutes. Uh, Sorry? Two minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so I hope I've shed um, some light on why I do um, what I do. Um, but in summary, um, I'd say that I love looking and I draw to see more to discover and record the um, interaction between part and whole and between myself and the wider world. Um, and I'm trying to pin down specific characteristics of the spaces um, that I come across and, and hope to convey my subjective experience of time um, as I do so. And finally, um, I just wanted to finish by saying how grateful I am to Glenn and to Tim Hyman and to numerous other people who I haven't had um, time to mention for their generosity and their all their many astute comments, which have been so, uh, have had such an impact um, on my work. And also to say how excited I am by the opportunities that I have um, to teach, which enriches my own drawings immeasurably. Um, and I hope also enables me to pass on um, an enthusiasm for um, looking closely uh, through drawing. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you'd uh, like to stay in touch, please uh, do so through my website or um, my Instagram account. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex, for the informative and hugely interesting and we'll want to take up some of the points I'm sure in the discussion following. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to now invite uh, Rachel Gadsden to join us. A few words about Rachel in the first instance. Expressionist in approach, and this is how she prefers to think of herself. Rachel creates solo exhibitions, performances and collaborative social engagement projects with disabled, vulnerable, and mainstream communities nationally and internationally, using painting, performance, digital film, and animation, with the object of developing cross-cultural dialogues around universal notions of humanity and the human condition. She has exhibited her work, or performed, in venues in the UK, Europe, Australia, the Gulf region, Latin America, and the Far East. And the countries are innumerable. I overheard Rachel say today that she does an enormous amount of traveling for her work. Her work is represented in major collections in, in the UK, including the Royal Art Collections Trust, uh, the UK Parliament, Mandela's Walk to Freedom in South Africa, the Fédération Internationale de Football Association, National International Football Association, and the National Paralympic Heritage Trust. 
Notably, she was awarded the FIFA Hyundai Commission for the Women's Football World Cup in Paris in 2019. And Rachel and I go back, also go back many years. So welcome, Rachel. Thanks for joining us today. It's um, brilliant to be here today. And uh, thank you, Glenn, for your fantastic presentation and Alexandra as well. It's really interesting. And although Alexandra and I couldn't have more different practices as you were talking, I could see so many sim similarities in our practices too. So um, I'm sort of going to do a bit of a whistle tour around some of the projects I've been involved in. And uh, as Glenn said, um, I work with vulnerable and uh, disabled and mainstream communities around the world, but none of these projects happen without my own practice. And so primarily I get commissions. I'm invited to um, undertake various exhibitions here or abroad, but as a sort of social uh, feeling about how I feel about the world, I will never do a project without saying, actually, we have to invite people who wouldn't have the opportunity that I have to also be part of this practice in some way. So I tend to always want there to be some form of social engagement, but that's partly because, you know, is my voice really that important? I sort of have this real sense that, you know, if I'm trying to make work about the human condition, it has to be about the bigger human condition and the universal human condition. And that's essentially what interests me most of all. So as Glenn said, my work, you know, I've been lucky to be artist at Parliament for four major projects. I was at Hampton Court Palace for a year. I've actually had commissions, I think for four of the Paralympic um, games and Olympic games, Sochi, Beijing, London, Brazil. This was actually for the winter Sochi um, Olympics, uh, Paralympic, oh no, ski games, the winter games. It wasn't the Olympics actually, uh, Paralympics, it was the mainstream games, but I'm a disabled person. Um, I was born with a medical condition, a hereditary medical condition. And as a effect of that, I live with really quite um, complex uh, disabilities, but rather than ever seeing these something that's limited my practice or has in any way um, hindered my practice. I feel it's given me a voice, a voice to understand this whole sense of being alive and wanting to stay alive. And the physical struggle and energy of the body's process as it stays alive, as you'll see, is absolutely constant in my work. It's a manifestation perhaps of my own personal struggle, but visually utilized as a metaphorical reference for universal struggle underpinned by notions of survival, resilience, and as we've all found very much in the last 15 months, hope, because without hope, there is absolutely nothing. Some of you may already know this because I've recognized lots of friends here, which is lovely, but also um, those that don't, I choose to call myself a disabled artist, uh, not because I necessarily have ever felt I'm disabled, but it's a very conscious thing because I'm an activist and I want to bring cultural change. And there's huge discriminations for disabled people. And I hid for a long time as a disabled person because I wouldn't have got the commissions that I got. And it's still a fact that the disabled voice is only ever normally present within the structures of outreach and also education sides of mainstream galleries. And yet in fact, it's something that is about identity and in the same way that Black Lives Matter, we as disabled people must not be removed, which so often we are. So you can actually see the very anatomical nature of my work. And I'm injected every minute by a machine that extends my breathing and enables me to breathe. And just that whole sense of being able to breathe is central to my work. And this exhibition, this breathing world in Qatar came about as a result of my Olympic uh, London 2012 exhibition. And I was invited by the Qatari government who saw it to represent Britain as part of their Qatar UK Year of Culture 2013. And I was very lucky that uh, Prince Charles and uh, the Duchess of Cornwall opened the show, which was significant because obviously I'd been at the Royal Drawing School for many years under Glenn's guidance. And it was very nice to sort of think that there was different things coming together. So about 60 
of my artworks were taken out to Qatar. I returned to the Middle East for the first time in about 20 years, having spent the first 20 years of my life actually in the Middle East with my family, my twins here today. And it was a real reawakening of my heritage, of my sense of this uh, universal cultural identity. You know, we were British, you know, parents lived out there, but you know, I never felt that I was English. I just felt that we were what we were, which was, I suppose, expats in the Middle East. And all of a sudden I began to realize that where I had been resuscitated many times in the Middle East as a child, which meant I stayed alive, there were many young people in the region that really didn't have lives where they were part of, of the society. And over the last 10 years, uh, my husband Tim and I um, have probably visited the Middle East um, region maybe I don't know, 15, 20 times right the way across the region. This was actually quite a major commission I received for the Miss Festival in uh, Saudi. And at the time when I went out there, I had no idea that I was the first uh, performance artist that had been invited, woman performance artist that had been invited to actually create uh, a piece. And it was the moment where there was beginning to be quite a big change in the Middle East and particularly in Saudi. And this piece was called Al Nur Fragile Vision. Uh, I have also lost a huge amount of my sight. And again, I've never seen it as necessarily a negative side of being an artist. I mean, it was at the beginning. I think Glenn was around when I first found out that I was losing my sight. And I know he witnessed me being really quite traumatized, but ultimately it's been the most freeing thing that's ever happened to me because now, I rely on my imagination, my consciousness, and a whole different sense when I'm making my work. And whether I can see or not see does not stop me making my work. I might not be able to do the building drawings that Annabelle so beautifully creates because I would never see the detail that she sees, but I certainly appreciate the anatomical nature of the work she cre creates. So this piece was all based on me taking on the vision of, um, uh, one of the birds that they they um, fly in the Middle East, all of a sudden I've forgotten the name of the bird, which is terrible, it's not a hawk, um, but anyway, a bird, and these hoods that they put on the bird, and how actually I survive a storm as this bird coming out of the storm to see the light. I was also had the opportunity to work with about 40 Saudi women. This really was before some of the change happened. And it was extraordinary, the work that these women produced in the studios. Some of them were local villagers. Some of them were very much from um, the uh, elite side of the Saudi uh, community, but they came into these spaces and came into the workshops with me during the day. The performances tended to happen at night and made these really quite powerful paintings. These just give you a sense of some of the works, but the drawings were really amazing. And the thing that was so noticeable was they wanted freedom, which of course, we're much luckier and have far greater freedom um, in our own community. I returned again two years later with another performance piece, which took on a whole different uh, energy and digital work um, with a composer and it was about the frankincense journeys through um, through the Middle East um, and also the Iraqi and Syrian journeys of women that they've been taking during the last few years escaping the trouble in uh, Syria and the region. I That's often do minutes, uh, uh, projects which also uh, work with women here and this was with advanced charity I'm going to do a little bit of a whistle stop tour now but this was with women who suffered great domestic violence in UK then this is another project in Hong Kong in 2019 with disabled and non-disabled artists who were as you know all going through a lot of trouble at the moment because of the um, battles that are coming from China and then this is the project which I worked with Syrian and Iraqi refugees. And I've been working with Birmingham University, Dr. Yafa Shanik, an anthropologist, and we're going to refugee camps and hearing the stories of women um, who are sharing their trips across the Mediterranean Sea. 
they're just people like all of us, these different individuals who want to survive and want to have a free world. And that's basically what I'm most interested in. Now, football, who cares about football? Well, I don't really, but my dad would hate, hate me to say that because obviously he was a footballer and played for West Ham. But I did get this extraordinary commission for the Women's World Cup. And it was very um, gracious that they decided that women do not have the voice they should have. And so they wanted to identify this as the main theme for the games. And they chose Mia Hamm, who's one of the great footballers of the women's game, um, to be honoured. And I was there to create um, an artwork that honoured her role within the game. She's a humanist. She's just the most incredible woman who supports all sorts of um, discriminations. She was born with club feet and couldn't walk until she was about uh, six years of age. This is just a quote which comes back to me time and time again. Anyone who cannot cope with life while he is alive needs one hand to ward off a little his despair over his fate. But with his other hand, he can jot down what he sees amongst the ruins, for he sees different and more things than the others. After all, he is dead in his own lifetime and the real survivor. Franz Kafka's diary, October the 19th, 1921. Thank you. Thank you very much again, Rachel. Uh, amazing presentation. Um, so hugely prolific, um, such an enormous body of work in recent years and of interactions with groups as well, all this energy coming from a position of some vulnerability and, as you described it, disability. I'm always very struck by your tremendous strength of spirit um, and your interest in engaging with others. So we have two, two artists who are, um, there are some interesting overlaps and connections here. It's 4.40, we've got some time to explore this, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your comments and questions. Um, they can go into the chat, and I think also if you do raise a hand, I probably will see you. Uh, you're all fairly visible, except for those who are um, uh, who don't have a video on. So do just let me know in a chat. I have my chat box open and ready to receive any questions that come through. Yeah. Perhaps I could start um, by uh, picking up on uh, Alex's um, fascinating um, exploration of time to alert her to the work of Henry Bergson, who you may know, and his ideas of simultaneity, of mm. different things happening um, roughly at the same time and clearly um, interrelated in some way, as you described so brilliantly um, in your own work, but also in the work of others. Um, I noted a great sort of elegance of Marx coming through in this later period, the drawings made by the river, and how in fact there's been a change in the language of the Marx, in the way that Marx clustered and formed what I sensed overall was, yes, a great enrichment of the visual and almost a, a kind of voracious quality in the looking itself, in the taking in of the world. So here is, I think, a very private artist who's exercising the eye and doing so in public spaces. Whereas with Rachel, I see someone who's deeply engaged in a kind of social activism and at the same time very much in touch with her own processes and vulnerability, looking into herself as much as outside, the question of looking itself interrogated, since as Rachel explains, her eyesight has changed. And I was fascinated to hear of the sense of liberation that you feel 
as you come to rely on the imaginative processes that are speculative, internal, and not bothering whether something is a good mirror of the world itself, uh, but somehow rings true all the same. And that truth measured not simply as an aesthetic sine qua non condition, but as engagement, communication, transmission, another a whole set of criteria. I wanted to ask you, Rachel, are you an Arabic speaker? <laughs> it's a bit of a sore point, actually, Glenn, because we did. <laughs> When Tim and I went to quite a lot of Arabic classes a couple of years ago. Uh, we were when we were younger. Uh, my twin and I spoke quite a lot of Arabic because we spent a lot of time in hospital. So we learned from the nurses as well as um, at school. And then this passage of time lost it all. When I'm in workshops, I understand a lot of words, but I'm still not confident. I, I, can, I can speak a little bit of Arabic. And... And Alex, I wanted to ask you also, I suppose, touching on languages in your case, what I sense is through your discovery of Robert Campin, an engagement with art history and with time in a sort of deep, deeper sense. I wondered how this is shaping your language, your interest in the eye and in the process of looking and seeing. So, so how, how my interest in Robert Campin in particular is shaping that? Well, I gather what you're doing is engaging with art history as such. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a really interesting interaction. And I've always, even when I was at university, I, 30% of my course was history of art. So it's always been something that's been really interesting to me and always fed into my work. And, but I think even more so now the teaching that I do do, because I've, I've for a long time been interested in ways of drawing space and time that aren't restricted by perspective. Um, so that was one of the reasons I went to Japan and, and then my interest in early Netherlandish painting. And, and then that also got me started teaching at the Courtauld, which made me delve into it further. So there's a real backwards and forwards um, between the two. Um, and they're so interwoven, like quite literally one feeds into the other all the time. And I find it, yeah, I, I feel, I, yeah, it feels like such a privilege to be able to see, see these works of art and work with them closely and talk, discuss them with other students and then also let that feed back into my work. So yeah, it's really, really important to me. Rachel has uh, posted a question to you, Alex, uh, whether you could just say a few words about your, the use of negative space in your drawing process. Those are Rachel's words. Um, yeah, so thanks, Rachel. Um, uh, so that first came about uh, on the building, with the drawings I was making on the building site. Um, and it's been associated, I think, all the way along with uh the passage of time and that i often feel like if i draw something with define a form with negative space so just by drawing the things that are around it somehow the mass of the the sense of mass of the form that's defined with the negative space feels stronger than if i'd actually drawn it and it seems to change the quality of time in the image it, it i think it makes you feel a sense of this form is here now but it also suggests a time in the past when it wasn't there and a time in the future when it may not be there again um and i and that was also what you know one of the things that was happening you know with drawing the ships i think it's 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 become even stronger drawing by the thames particularly that part of the thames because you really feel the power of the tides and those cyclical forces and that sense of presence and absence is so tangible in the actual landscape so yeah, it's become, and that drawing with the ship in it, it was, uh, that was part, that negative space was part of the way of, of trying to define that, that presence and absence um, of a form. Thank you very much, Alex. Now, one question I put to both of our contributors, to Alex and Rachel, was whether they would talk us through a little bit of 
their motivations. And I think Rachel has done so very powerfully and so has Alex too in her terms. Uh, and touching on the increasing professionalization of their work. I did so because I'm very moved and find it fascinating to see two women uh, making very steady, sure progress in their careers. And I know that this is a subject that's of great interest to all of us, to all of you. And so this message of empowerment was one that was coming through in my conversations with them both. Um, and I wanted to, that message in particular, to be sort of clear, crystal clear in this gathering, since it, uh, it touches on all of us and uh, on what we do. And I know that it is a preoccupation for many of you as artists. I wondered if someone wanted to perhaps comment on any of those uh, aspects. It's an open question, of course, and it's for an on, ongoing discussion. But um, I am interested in how Alex and Rachel have individually addressed it in their way. And again, thinking of Alex's very private initial steps that begin with the work of the eye and visuality. With Rachel, of course, it's not so much the work of the eye, but it is a social engagement that's there as a sort of fundamental driver. And I think another forceful element there is the will to live, to survive, which you, of course, spoke about very poignantly and referred to in your last readings of Kafka, for instance. There's a lot there. There is a lot there. Um, uh, can I say something? Please do. Um, to Rachel and Alex, that there must be a hidden drive that's in you that can't be altered. So you are following it and you have control over it. Or can, or do you have control? Hmm. There's such a strong drive and vision. It, it's very hard to describe, it's non-verbal. How do you describe it? I think all of us do. I don't think that drive doesn't exist within all of us. I just think it manifests itself in different ways. And I've always felt that creativity isn't about how much you produce or necessarily how, how um, prolific you are or, or, you know, you can just have a creative thought and that drives you forward. And I think it's really important and I think it's, you know, I meet people on my travels who are in camps, who don't have any paper, who can't draw. So you have to go in and start maybe discussing, creating work with them. You know, they've never even necessarily done any art in their life. But, you know, within about five minutes, you give them some paper and some charcoal. And all of a sudden they express something that is so deeply moving that it could be in the Tate Gallery. They're not trained. It's quite extraordinary. Mm. And I've exhibited, I always insist that there is work exhibited by anybody that I might, you know, be working on a project with. And what it's made me realize is that, you know, just doing it is the key. And if nothing else, we just have to each, if we want to be creative, it's up to us. Mm. And it doesn't require drive. It's actually just about doing it and not waiting for that moment where this magic is going to happen because it doesn't happen. Mm. It never happens. It's just about practice. And if I, I'm sure Alex, I can see so clearly in her own work that it's just that continue. If somebody said, what's your practice? It is a practice that's 30, however many years drawing and mm. thinking it. 24 hours a day, every day, or not 24 hours a day, but pretty much it's it's full time. Yeah, I think I, I really agree with you, Rachel. And I, I think it 
that that I, I recognize that you know what you're saying, although I'm teaching, you know, obviously not as extreme situations as you are, but I often see within people that if they have a desire to draw, then, you know, then then they can make the most incredible things, you know, it's, it's and I think also uh, what you're saying about it being something that you do and uh, rather than forcing yourself to do, I think that was another big shift, like, you know, when I was, um, you know, I think when I was younger, I had this idea, I must be an artist, I must be an artist. And but actually, once I stepped back from that, and you know, started just drawing, just doing the thing that I actually really loved and felt so liberating. And I was so, you know, when I really was engaged with the things that I was actually thinking about and interested in and excited by on the street and in the building site, and doing it so often, like nearly every day, you know, I learned so much through the process of doing it. Um, and so it was a strange mixture of relaxing and going with the energy at the same time. You know, it wasn't a forcing yourself to do something. It was finding a path of energy that kind of took me with it. Um, yeah, which. There is something that I constantly say to if I'm in a university situation or I'm with sort of artists at art colleges doing courses or, you know, nobody comes looking for you. So if you want to stay in your studio and make your work all your life, that's absolutely fine. But if you want to reach out with your work, you're gonna to have to get it out there. And it's all shifted now. There aren't these incredible patrons that come along and start, start presenting your work in the way they might've done in the past. So any young artists now, most of them are pretty good at doing it with their Instagram um, pages and various other things. But I think there is this sense that if you, you know, I, I didn't find, I didn't apply for the um, commission, for the FIFA commission. And it came about in a very, very strange way, which I could never have, you know, understood at the time. Somebody saw a performance, somebody talked to somebody else about that performance, five years passed by, and then a Hyundai director said, I've been planning this for five years because of a brief conversation I had about your work and the experience somebody got from it. And you don't know that. Mm. And I think that there are probably many that of those things have happened. So you have to just put the energy there and it will probably come back. Yeah, I really agree. I think so many things come through conversations as well. I mean, that was how I, how I came to have the residency on the building site was because through some other teaching I was doing in the landscape architecture department at the University of East London, I happened on the same crit panel to uh, was the landscape architect for the Dawson Square project. We got talking about Dawson, she came to see my drawings and she suggested to the um, uh, construction uh, company that that I could, you know, have this residency. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, as you say, it's being out there and talking to people is so important. We've uh, managed to get into the last five minutes of our time without really mentioning the year that we've all lived through. Um, and I wonder if you, like me, are beginning to feel a little bit of a, a, little bit of a spring in your step, having come through this uh, quite horrendous year, and perhaps beginning to feel that the way is easing somewhat. Uh, what is moving for me of this gathering is that it is a sign of resilience, a word that uh, Rachel used in her presentation, of a uh, continuing friendship among uh, visual artists, um, perhaps a testimony itself of our sense of endurance of coming through the year, and perhaps being able to look forward well positively to the time ahead. I liked the way that both Alex and Rachel spoke about making connections. Um, in a sense, taking the initiative into our own hands to get out, um, to uh, relate, to meet, and to communicate what we do. So as I, as I have you all here on my screen, congregated, very mindful of how all of those personalities, all those extraordinary characters that you are with um, rich thinking lives and creative lives um, is a sort of world, really, 
uh, and what a positive and and hopeful sign this is really that we're able to to meet in this way to gather in this way i have um, promised somehow in uh, in a very low quiet voice that there will be a third reading um, the difference of the third reading and the first and second is that there is nothing else driving it than my own wish to somehow record my gratitude to mentor figures. This is something that Alex spoke about very clearly. Um, and the importance for her of tracing that lineage. And that lineage goes back for her to 17th century Chinese painters and, uh, and uh, Japanese artists of the 19th century and so on. Um, for me, those links are very much about our time, but mostly there are people who are no longer with us. And so I'm very keen now to record who those individuals were, the force of their lives, and what they brought to mind, the way they, they enriched my own process. And I'm beginning to think about that and, and work on that. And so um, I hope that there'll be a chance to share those thoughts with you as we move forward. But that is something I'm sort of slating for later on, the promise of a third reading of some kind. I hope it's been worthwhile. Um, uh, I apologize for over uh, stepping the time, which I oh. can do unless I'm warned. <laughs> um, but it was a pleasure, great pleasure seeing you all. I'm so glad that you could be with us and particularly happy to see some of you who haven't been with us for a while. Uh, I hope this all grows, uh, perhaps promises um, more contact in future. Uh, look forward to seeing more of you um, as we look ahead. I am exploring uh, opportunities for a in-person workshop. Um, I have found, been looking at uh, venues recently and I'll be able to report on that as uh, hopefully as things situation normalizes and the restrictions are eased and it looks more possible. But I'll be in touch uh, about those ideas later on. Thank you all very much for for joining me this afternoon.